Well, we're going live. We're going to be starting our service at 11 o'clock, but we're coming on a little early to get, uh, let people get settled in. And we're looking forward to spending a little time with everyone this, this morning. It's good to see our friends. And uh, I put the, I put the phone on uh, Do Not Disturb because there was just a whole flood of uh, tweets coming through. And uh, so <laughs> we <laughs> do that. Learned a lesson on that a while back. But uh, good to see Laurie and Mark and, 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 uh, and Arlene must be there too. Arlene yeah, Lund. Yes, Deb. Good to see you all. Um, are tuning in. So we've had another busy week here actually. We we don't have any trouble staying busy. That's true. Uh, the days actually yeah, are it, going fast for us. It's we, not boring here at no. the Mayberry household. <laughs> no. uh, there's plenty to do. We've been calling people and uh, getting, uh, doing the preparation for the various things, uh, for the Wednesday night meeting and for the Sabbath morning meeting and, and uh, other things that we just uh, need to be doing. And it, it just seems to go so fast, doesn't it? It's just like, it where did the day go? But uh, Lord is with and us and we're, we're glad of that. We hope that it's the same for all of you out there. Um, we see... Grandma Eileen is watching too. Wonderful. Yeah, there. We see them talking on the news or whatever about, if you're bored, you know, watch this <laughs> what are or you do gonna that. Do? And it's like, <laughs> it, we don't have any problem with boredom. That's so, for sure. So we hope that you don't either and, and yeah. that you're finding constructive ways to use your time and, and, and of course, using that time to... Welcome, uh, Andrew. Get closer to God and, and spending time in His Word. Well, it's 11 o'clock, so we're going to start here. Okay. And just uh, want, just want to welcome each one of you. It's, it's good to have you with us once again. And uh, we know the Lord will bless. Whoever two or three are gathered together, it says there, Jesus says, I am there in the midst of them. And that is certainly true, even though we might be separated by miles. God is with us, and Jesus is right in the midst of us. We're going to um, have a few announcements, and then uh, we're going to sing some kids' songs. So if there's some kids, get ready. For that, we'll sing a, a few kids' songs, and then Karen and I will sing a number, and then we'll have the message. So, uh, we've enjoyed uh, having you with us on the last two weeks. We've spent two weeks already since we started doing this online with our online worship, uh, doing a midweek service, and uh, also the, the 11 o'clock service to each of those, and, and uh, all the videos, are, we're uploading to our YouTube channel. Um, it's uh, called uh, Southwest District MNSDA on YouTube. And um, it's easy to find it if you're here with us on Facebook. Just go to uh, my page, uh, Ken Mayberry page, and right under the, the uh, picture there is the link to the YouTube channel. And um, all of our uh, some people have already said we're we're looking at those and and uh, enjoying them. So they're all up there for God's honor and glory, and we just want uh, Him to be uplifted by by that by what we're we're doing here. That's what our ministry is all about: is lifting up Jesus, because Jesus is the really the He He came and and. Uh, he is a revelation of, of God, and uh, it's a surprise to a lot of people to realize that Jesus is what Jesus was. That's what God is. Well, uh, we've had some cancellations. 
sadly. Um, there have been, we're adding to the list. I was on the, um, there was a, a Zoom meeting that I had with Claudio and Pam Consuegra a few days ago, and it had, we had all the, the leaders of the men's retreat, our well, men's ministries and family ministries. And um, it was just sad to hear everybody was saying what, that their, their particular projects were being canceled, and it was sad to hear. Uh, we have a men's retreat at the end of April. We were going to have Desmond Doss Jr., but uh, we're going to have to uh, cancel that for this year. But the good news. That's Desmond Doss Jr. has told, told us that he will plan to be with us in 2021. So we're looking forward to that. That's good. Uh, we were really disappointed because we were looking forward to having him with us. Um, also, the general conference in July has been uh, put back to May of uh, 2021. Um, the constituency session for the Minnesota Conference, which was going to be in May, is now going to be in October uh, of this year. And camp meeting, it's always uh, been in June. And, and uh, what did somebody say the other day? Kathy Park told me that it hadn't been canceled since World War II camp meeting. Kathy's our historian. Mm -hmm. For Minnesota. So that's that. It is sad to to see that, um, but we're we're in unusual times. Yeah. Um, Sabbath school quarterlies. If you have, uh, if a number of you have been able to get your Sabbath school quarterlies for those in Wyndham, they're available at the church. If you have a key to the church, and otherwise at uh, at Pastor Ed's place and. Uh, I know a number of you have already been over to Ed's place and gotten your quarterly. And then for the other churches, uh, just call your uh, the head elder or deacon and uh, if you need a quarterly and, and we'll figure that out of how, how you can get uh, those quarterlies. If they haven't done that already, they probably have already been thinking about that. Uh, also, for tithes and offerings, every, every Sabbath we have that that's part of our worship is to bring our tithes and our offerings and uh, so remember to do that uh, as Paul said se uh, separate it out by yourself at home and set it aside so that when he comes he won't have to uh, you know it'll all be ready that that's the key so you can also use the uh, adventistgiving.org and you can set up a weekly uh, donation uh, there or uh, you can just go on each week and, and give your offerings there. So that's another option but our church, our churches even though we're not being able to meet there, our churches still need to, to operate and, and our conference needs to operate and uh, to support our pastors and teachers during this time. So we appreciate your faithfulness in, in giving to the Lord. Um, and after all, you know what? God's law, if we were to sum it all up, the key word in God's law is love. And there's two parts to it, isn't there? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And what's the other part? Love your neighbor as yourself and so that's what we're doing when we're in staying home we're acting in full harmony with God's law of love that's we wouldn't want to if I wasn't sick I wouldn't want somebody going across my pathway and spewing all the, the germs uh, in front of me and if I was sick I would want somebody to care enough and love me enough to take care of me so we want to, during this time, to exercise that, that golden rule, practice the golden rule. So you mentioned we're in, in turbulent times, is that the word? Yeah. Or, there, are, there are people out there, you know, with the changes um, happening day by day, and 
a lot of confusion, a lot of uncertainty. People are becoming more, some people are becoming more anxious and scared. What can yes. you say to everyone to help? Those who are fearful. It's a temptation for all of us to be fearful, but Jesus said uh, in to the message to Sardis, he said, don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. So you notice he, he didn't just sugarcoat it and saying you're not going to have to go through anything. But he, does, he did say, don't be afraid. And uh, it's just like with Noah and the ark. Noah and his family had nothing to be afraid of if they were in the ark. And for us today, Jesus is our ark of safety. And if we flee to him... We flee to Mount Zion like we did. We mentioned in our, our sermon about Sodom and Gomorrah. If we flee to Mount Zion, that's where the refuge is. And uh, we need to be doing that every day. You know, this, the, the unpreparedness of, uh, of the world for this crisis is a lesson that we need to, to every day be studying our Bibles and, and uh, it's like the parable of, that Jesus talked about, the, the ten virgins. The, the five wise virgins had that extra oil. And we get that extra oil by spending that extra time with Jesus every day and to prepare for crisis time ahead. And I think that, you know, that's the message during this time. We don't know um, where this is going to lead and what's coming in the future. But one day at a time, we can trust God and prepare. Jesus says, watch and pray so that you don't found, be found uh, wanting. You don't be found naked, but be clothed in his righteousness. That's what we want to be doing every day. So don't be afraid if you're you in know, Jesus. The spirit of fear doesn't come from God. So as That's we true. draw closer to him, it, those fears will diminish. Amen. That's, that's true. Well, let's sing some of those kids' songs. Um, let's, let's start with, I've got a river of life. Jesus talked about to the woman at the well. He, he said, if it, the water that I give will be like a well springing up from inside. And that's the, the water of life, the Holy Spirit that gives to us and God's love in our hearts. <laughs> The joy, joy, joy. Jesus said, I say these things to you so that your joy might be full. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in
That's what we're doing. We're all coming together to praise the name of Jesus. Let us come together, praise the name of Jesus. All you people of the earth, come and see. Let us come together, praise the name of Jesus. All you people of the earth, come and hear. That joy is like the sunshine raining down upon us. And joy is like a golden crown. Let us come together, praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to have to get a drink. Okay. It's Hallelujah. Hallel means praise. U means you. And Yah is the first part of God's name, Yahweh. Hallelujah. Well, I think I'm going to have to get a little bit of a, of a drink too. And then we're going to sing a song. I just realized I touched my face. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's, it's your... your uh, your danger, We're, isn't it? Yeah, it's my danger. We've been home for how many days? Hmm. Yep. We're safe so far. Safe so God far. Willing, we'll we were out. The last time we were out was for Kale's birthday. Last Sunday. And uh, <clears throat> that was nice to to be with them for that. But we want to sing if that isn't love. Um, when you look at Jesus and what he has done for us God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and greater love has no man than this that he should lay down his life for his friends Jesus said and when you look at all that Jesus has done for us we can just say, if that isn't love, what is? He left the splendor of heaven Knowing his destiny Was the lonely stars in the sky and the sparrow can't fly if that isn't love then heaven's a myth there's no feeling like this if that isn't promised him paradise if that isn't love the ocean 
ocean is dry There's no scars in the sky And the sparrow can fly If that isn't love Then heaven's a myth There's no feeling like this As soon as we accept Jesus as our personal Savior and we become a member of the church that believes that it's been given the Elijah message for the end of time, we inevitably find ourselves in one of the following situations. First, you might find yourself in a situation in which you have an opportunity to speak for God. Maybe it's on the subject of evolution or church and state, or the Sabbath, or your love for Jesus, how he has supplied all of your needs, or another situation you might have, you see a friend that uh, may be straying from the path, and uh, you have an opportunity to speak to that friend in love and warn him of his danger. Or another situation, you might uh, be feeling the pressure of the world that's making its demand on you and and you must choose between loyalty or disloyalty obedience or disobedience and when we find ourselves in one of these situations we tend to want to sit on the fence and why do we want to sit on the fence because we're afraid we're afraid that our speaking the truth or our resisting the world's pressure will only make matters worse. We don't want to rock the boat. We're afraid that we'll be put down or made fun of or we may lose our friends or even our job. And the time will come as we get closer to the end when we'll be afraid of being put in prison or even put to death. The Bible tells us, and Jesus himself tells us that. The people will think that in uh, putting you to death, they'll be doing God a service. But this fear reveals a deeper reason why we don't get off the fence. We are really thinking, unconsciously perhaps, that our God isn't really able to see us through whatever may happen as a result of our faithfulness to him. We're thinking that even if he is willing, he's not able to stand by us in difficulty, that obedience will bring with it more trouble than it's worth. And the result is the wrong that we keep silent about gets worse and our friend stays farther, strays farther from the path. 
and the truth of God that could make a difference in someone's life makes no difference. Or we find ourselves yielding to the world's demands and we find ourselves off the fence, on the wrong side of the fence. What we need is something from God's Word to renew our confidence that our God really is able to stand by us in difficulty and to give us strength to do what we know we should. We need something that can show us how great the possibilities are if we, are, if we allow our Lord to act and speak through us. And the Lord has wonderfully supplied that need in the experience of Elijah. It's found in 1 Kings. And as we come on the scene, it's been nearly a hundred years now since the days of David and Solomon, about 70 years since the kingdom of Israel was divided in Israel and Judah, and now in 1 Kings 16, verse, beginning with verse 29, we read this. On the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of Yahweh than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and to worship him. He set up an altar to Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole, and did more to provoke Yahweh, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. To give us a clear picture of Elijah's situation, we need to understand something about Baal and Asherah poles. Baal, or Baal, means Lord or Master. It's really a title, not a proper name. Baal's name was actually Hadad, the storm god. So they called him Baal Hadad, Lord Hadad. The storm god. He was Baal, or master of the gods. They believed that he brought the winter rains and the storms with their lightning and thunder. This is what all the culture around Israel believed, the Baal worshippers. They believe that Hadad they believe that Hadad was responsible for the fertility of the land. And uh, his sister Anat was the ferocious goddess of bloodshed and war. And his arch enemy was Mat, the god of drought and scorching heat. And according to myth, Mat killed Hadad and Anat begged him to bring her brother back to life again. But when all their, her efforts failed, she became furious and in a rage overpowered and killed Mott. How would you like to have gods like that to worship? She then took her dead brother and carried him to the mountain of the gods where he was brought back to life again. And after that, they believed that Baal's death and resurrection took place every year, and the result was the two main seasons, summer and winter. It's a very subtle counterfeit to the truth of God. Parallel to Israel's feasts and festivals. Baal's death at the end of each rainy season around June was remembered by bitter weeping and mourning. And the yearly resurrection of Baal, Hadad, at the end of the long dry summer when the rainy season began, bringing life to the fields and the vineyards, was celebrated with joyous feasting. And in the interest of decency, we're not going to go into detail as to what went on at those feasts. The Asherah were apparently some something like totem poles and were carved to depict 
to depict Ashtaroth, the goddess of fertility. Can you imagine a worse situation for a true believer in Israel? The king of Israel, the spiritual leader of the nation, had given himself up to that kind of worship. Is it really any different for you and me today? What can one person do? What can one person really do to make a difference? But there was one man of faith who trusted in Yahweh, the God of Israel, the true giver of life and fertility, and his name was Eliyah. Eli means El is God, Eli is my God, and Yah was the first part of God's name, Yahweh. So his name, Eliyah, meant my God is Yahweh. We know him as Elijah. He lived in the mountains of Gilead, east of the Jordan, and he was not afraid to speak up. He was just a country man with no high position, but he loved Yahweh and had devoted his life to the work of reform. As he saw Israel going deeper and deeper into idolatry and apostasy, he was distressed. I can see Elijah praying earnestly for God to step in and do something to lead Israel back to him, to get them to see their danger and repent before it was too late. And God would have, it, by that, when it was too late, God would have to destroy them as he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, and he didn't want to see that happen. And Yahweh answered his prayer. His appeals and warnings had failed to bring repentance, and the time had come for judgment. And since the worshipers of Baal claimed that he brought the rain and made the land fertile, the land would be cursed. And Elijah was chosen to give the message to Ahab. Now put yourself in the place of Elijah. Would you have had reason to be afraid to go before King Ahab and give that kind of a message? Certainly. The king could have you put to death. But Elijah trusted in the power of Yahweh to protect him. And he didn't hesitate. He traveled night and day until he reached Samaria. And he marched right into the palace. And Ahab looked up and there he was. And Elijah looked him right in the eye and he said, As Yahweh lives, the God of Israel, whom I serve, there shall not be dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And then he turned and was gone as suddenly as he had come. First Kings 17, First Kings 17 verse 2 says, Then the word of Yahweh came to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what Yahweh had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And then the brook dried up. Was Yahweh going to leave him to die of thirst? No. He provided a refuge in the house of the widow at Zarephath. Meanwhile, back at the palace, fall came and went, and there was no rain. So Ahab searched high and low for Elijah, but he couldn't find him. And Queen Jezebel was furious, and she lost no time in conferring with the priests of Baal, and they offered costly sacrifices to try to appease the anger of their gods, but no clouds appeared. One more year went by, and there was no rain. And Ahab sent messengers out to all the surrounding nations and required their kings to swear with an oath that Elijah was not in their land. And finally, Jezebel decided to fight back by killing every prophet of Yahweh that she could lay her hands on. The second year passed, 
And still, there was no repentance in Israel. There was no repentance from King Ahab. 1 Kings 18, verse 1 says, After a long time, in the third year, the word of Yahweh came to Elijah, Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now, how would you have responded to a message like that if you knew that Ahab was looking and had been looking for a couple of years to kill you? And Jezebel was killing all the prophets of God. Now God says, Elijah, go show yourself to Ahab. Wouldn't you have some reason to be afraid and question the Lord's wisdom? But not Elijah. He trusted God implicitly. God had given him a message, and he knew that his God would not let him down. 1 Kings 18 verse 2 says, So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab had summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in, in Yahweh. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Ahab had said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs and valleys, Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. And so they divided the land they were to cover. And Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in another. And verse 7, as Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my lord, Elijah? Yes, he replied, go tell your master, Elijah is here. Now, o o Obadiah's head could roll if he went back to Ahab empty-handed, saying that he had actually spoken to Elijah and not, had not brought him in. What have I done wrong, asked Obadiah, that you are handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death? As surely as Yahweh your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And whenever a nation or kingdom claimed you were not there, he made them swear that they could not find you. But now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here? I don't know where the spirit of Yahweh will carry you when I leave you. And if I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he'll kill me. Yet, I, your servant, have worshipped Yahweh since my youth. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of Yahweh? I had a hundred of, of the Lord's prophets. I hid them in two caves, fifty in each, and supplied them with food and water. And now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here? He'll kill me. Elijah said, as Yahweh Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. And so, verse 16, Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. What a way to talk to a king. While soldiers could take your life at the wave of his hand. But Elijah doesn't beat around the bush. He lays the blame just where it belongs, at the feet of Ahab himself. In fact, it seems that their roles are now reversed. Elijah becomes the monarch and Ahab the obedient subject. Now, summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel, Elijah said, and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And so Ahab sent word throughout all Israel 
and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Early in the morning, on the appointed day, all Israel gathered near the top of Mount Carmel. Jezebel's prophets march up, seemingly invincible. Who dares oppose them? The king, with the royal pomp, appears and takes his position at the head of the priests and accepts the applause of the multitude. But there's uneasiness in the hearts of the priests. The great showdown has come. But the gods they have trusted are unable to prove Elijah a false prophet. And there stands Elijah, the only one who appears to be on the side of Yahweh. And all becomes quiet as Elijah steps forward to speak. Everyone is anxiously waiting to hear what he has to say. And it says in 1 Kings 18, verse 21, Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you go stumbling between two opinions? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Is there no one? after three and a half years of God's judgments to step forward and show their loyalty to Yahweh. But the people, it says, answered not a word. No one was willing even then to get off the fence. First Kings 18, verse 22, Then Elijah said to them, Am I the only one of the Lord's prophets left? But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bowls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bowl and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of Yahweh. The God who answers by fire, he is God. And then all the people said, what you say is good. The people say, fair enough, let's do that. And imagine what it must have been like for the priests of Baal at this point. Talk about being put on the spot. 18 verse 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bowls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. And so they took the bull given them and they prepared it. And then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Oh, Baal, hear us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. According to the Hebrew lex lexicon, the word busy has the meaning of busy in the outhouse. Elijah really was pouring it on thick now. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought. Maybe he's out back in the outhouse. You need to call a little louder. Maybe he's traveling. Maybe he's on a vacation. Uh, maybe he's sleeping and you need to wake him up. Elijah was doing his best to make their God look powerless and fickle as they themselves. And then 1 Kings 18 verse 28 says, So they shouted louder and lashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. And then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. And they came to him, and he repaired the altar of Yahweh, which was in ruins, 
Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of Yahweh had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of Yahweh. And he dug a trench around it, large enough to hold two seahs of seed, three gallons or half bushel of seed. He dug a trench around that, that little altar. And he arranged the wood, and he cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. And then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Some people might wonder, well, where did they get the water all, with all the drought? Well, the Mediterranean Sea was just down the hill, a little ways away. Fill four large jars with water and pull it, pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it the third time. And the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. Then, as everything once again became quiet, so quiet you could hear a pin drop, Elijah stepped forward. And he prayed a simple prayer, which is beautiful in its simplicity, yet lays hold on omnipotent power. 1 Kings 18, verse 36 at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Yahweh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Yahweh. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Yahweh, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. And then the fire of Yahweh fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil and also licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. And by evening, the sky grew black with clouds and heavy rain came to revive and refresh the land. You can read about it this afternoon. The prophets of Baal, Hadad, were utterly defeated. And Israel was won back to loyalty to the true God. Today, history is being repeated. Ahab and Jezebel, Jezebel are alive and well today. Thousands are following the gods of this world. Riches and fame and pleasure. Pleasing fables permit them to follow the impulses of their own hearts. Human theories are put in the place of God and his law. Satan tempts men and women to disobey with the promise that in disobedience they'll find liberty and freedom that will make them as gods. He set up a false Sabbath. And he leads men and women to think that by resting on it, they are obeying the command of the Creator. The Elijah message comes today. How long will you go limping between two opinions? How long will you go on sitting on the fence? We're on the edge of eternity. What can be more important than being loyal to God who created all things? To love God with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus was willing to hang on a cross, naked and bruised and bleeding for you. Will you, like Elijah, trust him to the point of doing all that he wants you to do? Will you be a mouthpiece to speak for him 
in these last days, not being afraid of the consequences? May the Lord Almighty give you the love and the trust and the strength to do so is my prayer today. Shall we bow our heads? Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this story that you that has come down to us through the centuries and the millenniums that speaks to us today. We're thankful for Elijah, the way you worked through him for his faith and trust that we also may have the same faith and trust to love you and to follow you and to obey you and to speak for you and to not be sitting on the fence to clearly take our place with you and to follow the Lamb wherever he leads us. We pray you'll be with those today who are suffering. So many in hospitals today, not knowing if they're going to come out alive. Please be with them. Please be with your people around the world, that they may not fear, but that they may know that you are with them as you promised even to the end. And so we put our faith and trust in you and we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Well, have a great rest of the day. And uh, enjoy the nature, you know, don't be cooped up in the house all the time. Uh, call someone, encourage them, someone that might need some encouragement. And uh, spend time with your Bibles in this time when you're at home and, and uh, so many things are just shut down. Spend time with your Bibles and studying and, and knowing God and knowing Jesus and uh, it will you know if if you knew that there was a million dollars worth of silver and gold and precious stones in your garden in the backyard how much time would you spend digging in your garden <laughs> you'd be spending a lot of time out there digging in your garden and that's what's in God's Word what there's gold in there need to dig for it and you'll be happy that you did god bless you it's been good to spend this time with you and uh, look forward to uh, wednesday night we'll be back again seven o'clock wednesday night and we'll have a little time of of prayer and bible study together god bless happy sabbath everyone happy sabbath